Hi everyone, welcome to my YouTube channel. Today I'm going to be talking about the Sinhala Yashodara Vata or the story of Yashodara. Yashodara is um, Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha's wife, Shakyamuni Buddha, basically. So um, this is the woman that he left to go find enlightenment. Um, her name, Yashodara, actually means bearer of glory. And interestingly, um, it sounds a lot like um, Yeshadawa in the um, legend about the goddess Tara. Tara is a Buddhist goddess that um, is known for being a protectress and a demon slayer. When um, Buddha was te getting tempted by demons, he called on Tara and he slayed the demons for her. I remember reading this in the book called um, Tara the Feminine Divine by Bokar and Bosch. Um, I might be misquoting that. I think it's interesting that um, the two words just sound similar. That's just something that I came across um, myself reading about two different kind of things in Buddhism because Buddhism interests me. But um, this is a really cool poem. I'm going to be reading it and I'm going to be giving a little bit of my analysis. So um, this is poem is from likely the 18th century. The author Ranjini Obia Sakir. Um, I might I might totally be butchering that. Ranjini Obia Sakir. Who knows if I got that right? Sorry. Um, I'm very glad that she translated this so that these works can be kind of open up to a whole new um, set of eyes and scholarships. I find the poems incredibly beautiful on their own. Um, I cry when I read them. I might honestly cry on camera. We'll see how I manage, but um, it's incredibly beautiful seeing the sacrifice that this woman gave, or the sacrifices this woman did for the Buddha. And it's amazing how she recounts all of their past lives and what he's done for her and what she's done for him. And actually how he's honestly betrayed her in so, so, so many. You can really feel this woman's pain through these words. And even though this was written literally like a thousand plus years later, almost two thousand years later, um, I think that authors, I think that people, when they're making spiritually charged art, I think that if they are they have the right heart and the right mind, I think it's possible that they can kind of with their mind get into the Akashic Records and somehow communicate with that figure, you know? And that doesn't go for each work, you know, there's a lot of unrighteous works out there, but I think that this author really just tapped into this well of sadness that this woman left as she was, you know, crying for her husband. So I'm gonna read the poem. I don't know if I should do it straight through. I might stop a little bit throughout. Maybe if it's, um, if it makes sense. Through uncountable eons of measureless time, he perfected the virtues to become a Buddha. For yet more multiples of measureless time, he perfected those same virtues. For still more eons multiplied uncountable times, he strove to become a Buddha. Then, as a bud matures and comes to bloom, he became a Buddha. Limitless the oceans of samsara that he crossed, boundless the wealth he gave away, even his eyes, flesh, head, tirelessly the single-minded efforts that he made. Countless the times he gave his life to be a Buddha. Back in the days of the Buddha Dipankara, the Bosat was born as the hermit Sumera. That hermit by the marsh, proclaimed Dipankara, will one day in the future be a Buddha. The hermit made flower offerings to Dipankara, unwavering, single-minded, fully convinced. He paid his respects with both hands flower filled. It was at Rambegam the prophecy was made. From 24 Buddhas he received similar declarations. He lived each lifespan to its full completion. At Vesantara he led a life of renunciation. His acts of generosity then were beyond comprehension. The last of his many lives was spent in heaven. He realized then he was very near his goal. Gods enjoying bliss in the Brahma world gathered in hundreds and thousands to point the way. Sir, the time has come for you to be a Buddha. Give up this life of bliss. Set forth, my lord. Think of past pieties performed and be reborn. 
It was for this the Boisset had waited so long. He looked for the place where he was to be born, the land, the clan, with patience sought who his parents were to be. Who will I marry? What beauty is meant for me? His all-seeing eye, saw Dambadiva, was the land. Saw the womb of his mother, Maya, wife of King Sudovan. Saw five hundred lovely women wet nurses. Saw that his chief consort would be born at the same time. I will now go to Dambadiva, he declared. As Queen Maya was sleeping on her golden bed, all night long the full moon shone on her. The gold-limbed queen then to her husband said, Through three watches of the night, the Lord, my moon, shone on my bed. On a heavenly bed knee-deep in flowers, sleeping alone, the queen saw in a dream, a precious gem dropped deep into her womb. I do not know what is happening, my lord. As the queen lay sleeping on her flower-strewn bed, she saw a silver rock from the sky descend. A thousand queens stood guard around her bed. She told the king about the dream she had. By the white sands of the Nernanjana River, I was bathed and my hair was washed. Around me there arose a blazing fragrance. Dreams of childbirth followed one another. Hosts of maidens gathered flowers for me. In the Anotata Lake, they made a bed for me. A pair of virgin maidens then bathed me. The Anotata Lake appeared in a dream to me. A conch white baby elephant stood before me, who with his baby trunk caressed my belly. Will some auspicious thing happen to me? O oh, handsome king, what do these strange dreams mean? That day, the king invited holy Brahmins, fed them milk rice, and asked about the dream. That dream bodes ill to no one, O oh my king. A bosat will be born to the world, O oh king. King Surodana, since you ask, we say, bad dreams don't come to those who do good deeds. A child will be born, that's what those dreams mean. One of great merit, over three worlds he'll hold sway. As the queen was sleeping on her golden bed, a golden garland lay upon her bed. God slipped the golden garland over her head. This is what I dreamed at early dawn, she said. With parasols and flags, a crowd surrounded me. A golden star fell to earth beside me. I picked it up quickly as if it were full of nectar. Then deep into my womb sank that star. As on her flower-filled bed Queen Maya slept, she dreamt she was seated on Mount Maru's peak, saw a nearby village bathed in the full moon's beams. O king, what is the meaning of these dreams? As the queen slept on a bed made of silver, her dome-like breast began to fill with milk. A silver baby cobra coiled within her. Such dreams of childbirth constantly assailed her. Brahmins came to the palace vestibule and explained in full the meaning of the dreams. A noble bodhisattva will be born, O queen. All three worlds he will rule like the full moon. Thousands of celestial maidens he left behind. Abandoned a hundred thousand kinds of bliss. Saw his noble mother, Maya, the infinitely good. Then he descended from the sky, like a full moon. Queen Maya now has a pregnancy craving. Full of compassion, she gathers together the needy. Commands that homes be built for all the poor, and alms be also distributed there. Queen Maya has a second pregnancy craving. The city gates now open and close continuously, as do the palace gates, open for generous giving. In this way, Queen Maya satisfies her craving. Queen Maya has yet another craving. She wants the city to resemble one in heaven, orders a beautiful structure to be built, walks around the city and then enters it. I have a craving to take a walk in the Sala Grove. 
The park is all decorated in silver and gold. Four guardian gods come to keep careful watch. They joyfully escort her around the grove. The queen enters the sala grove full of delight. Flowers bloom, the sound of bees is all around. The cell tree bends for the queen, lowers itself to the ground, aware the ten-month pregnancy is complete. The mother can now see the prince within her, a pure gold image enclosed in a jeweled case. Decked in many wondrous ornaments, at that moment all the gods appear. She places her blessed hand on the trunk of the tree. The flowering branch bends low as if to adorn her. She grasps the lovely branch to ease her labor. They draw rich and beautiful curtains around her. She had felt her pregnancy only after ten and a half months. Her womb had hardly felt a cotton wisp of weight. The cool breath of flower-laden breezes wafted around. In the sala grove, the baby prince was born. Gods came through the sky and stood around her. Thousands of heavenly maidens surrounded her. The prince was born quickly, effortlessly. Great Brahma held a golden net to receive the baby. Like a moon, the prince rests on the net of gold. The lovely baby looks over the three worlds. Where there is none greater than he in all the three worlds, the prince gives out a joyous lion roar. Seven lotus blossoms bloom for the baby prince. He stands on them and looks in four directions. For Prince Siddhartha who gave that noble roar, gold milk is served to him without delay. Wet nurses on either side surround him. The ceaseless clamor of thousands is around him. Then like a full moon shining very brightly, he is taken to the palace with pomp and pageantry. Thousands of guards are stationed to protect him. Hundreds of thousands of heavenly flowers adorn him. Like a moon coming into fullness, the prince now comes into his 16th year. Arbosa acquires skills with bow and arrow. Yashodara becomes his chief queen as before. For 29 years, he lives the life of a layman then gladly abandons all pleasures, leaves his queen. Sick of samsara, he turns to the ascetic path. The king sends several queens to hold him back. Disillusioned, he turns away from that pleasure park. Whatever happens, I will leave today. The bolsat rises quickly from his bed. I'll abandon pleasures, become an ascetic, he says. Who is that standing at the door, he asks. It is I, Kana, Lord, who's by your door. Sorry, I, um, it, it started getting dark out here, so I had to just turn on the light. Um, so, virtues practiced over long years in samsara are now complete. The heralded prince has come. I will become an ascetic when I've seen my son. The fortunate prince Rahula has been born. My friend, our friendship stretches back through time. Today will be my final royal journey. Give me my rich and precious ornaments. Prepare my horse, friend, deck him in his finery. The minister weeps, tears stream down his face. I will now see my son and will come back, Siddhartha says. He goes to the royal palace where his wife resides and sees her in her bed fast asleep. He rests his blessed hand on the golden lintel, places his blessed foot on the golden door sill, sees her sleeping like a moon on her pure bed, withdraws his foot, turns away his head. She sleeps on a bed heap with lots of flowers. Milk flows from her swan breast for the baby prince. Yashodara, full of virtue, who has never done wrong, except perhaps unwittingly being a threat to Buddhahood. Her hair falls loose, long, blue-black curls frame her face like twirling tops. The baby in her arms suckles content. How can he leave once he's seen those golden breasts? From long ago I fulfilled all the virtues. I practiced giving to be a Buddha, to save all beings. She is lovely, moon-like, preeminent among women, 
Shall I just say one word to my dear queen? My lovely queen sleeps on her golden bed. Shall I draw near, look at my baby by her side? Her arm cradling him is a golden vine. My eyes are drawn to my lovely sleeping queen. The baby sucks his milk from that jeweled dome. What more is there to see? It is no use. You have never failed me, not in thought or in deed. His mind holds firm, his eyes fill with tears. You wept more tears for me than the seas hold water. Does this wide world hold a woman as good as you? Today I leave you in order to become a Buddha. I must destroy desire, be firm in my resolve. For one wife and one child shall I give up my quest? Or save countless creatures from the samsara ground? No, today I'll leave all I love, become an ascetic. But a radiant, lovely child is my Rahula. By the power of our past resolves, you and I are now prepared. You are paramount among women, Bimba, my queen. No more will we walk together the samsara ground. I will come back as a Buddha. Wait for me. Sandalwood scent wafts over her flower-filled bed. That sweet fragrance for many leagues extends. Most beautiful are you, my Yashodara. I'll return when I become a supreme Buddha. I leave my pure and gold limb clean behind. I withdraw my foot without a backward glance. I make this sacrifice to become a Buddha. He steps back, walks away, a radiant sun. Kana, long have we two walked this path together. We gave our word to each other many lives ago. The minister falls at the Bosat's blessed feet, asks, Lord, where is it you now intend to go? If you leave us, our land will be deserted. Don silk and shawls take a golden sword instead. Friend, do not impede my path to Buddhahood. Take out my horse and bring him to me now. One does not argue with the Bodhisattva. Kana sobs, walks to the horse Kantaka, Weeping hot tears, he decks him in full finery, lifts his hand and strokes the animal gently. The prince is dressed and now is ready to go. He presses his blessed feet on the threshold. With his gold sword tip, he opens the golden door and thinks of his beloved son and of his queen. He leaves to become an ascetic to help all men. She cuddles a sleeping child decked in ornaments. Her blue-black hair hangs loose about the bed coils upwards and curls around her face. On a bed strewn over with saman jasmine flowers, the queen rests relaxed, nestling her infant child. Like a garland made of golden kinihiri flowers, her blessed arm cradles her baby child. With his mind firmly set on becoming a Buddha, he forsakes past happiness for an ascetic life forsakes the ties of love that bind to samsara and those loose coils of blue-black curling hair. Her gentle face that comforts with cool kisses, the lovely child held closely in her arms, is a golden star beside a full moon. He leaves now, like the moon, thinking of his son. Like the full moon, the bosat steps outside, I go now to the forest, leave my gold-limbed child. Gold-limbed, he walks towards the river bank. I'll see my wife and child when I come back. He's seen the ills of samsara and is sickened. He jumps astride his good horse, Kantaka, crosses thirty leagues of woods and desert, stops when he reaches the banks of the river. Hooves beat down heavily, the horse leaps across the sand. The animal opens his mouth and neighs aloud. He flares his ears, then turns his head around, and lovingly he licks the prince's feet. It was a full moon night in the month of Asala. He crossed the river, came to a sandy bank, took off his ornaments, gave them all to Kana, told him to recross the river and go back. How can I go back, my noble lord and master? 
You leave us with an endless burning grief. We are lost. Our sun has sunk behind the mountain. How can I go back to that city to wait for whom? The bosa takes his golden sword in his hand, cuts off his hair and throws it into the sky. Sahampati, god of heaven, takes the relic, makes the first offering of a monk's requisites. The weeping minister falls upon the earth. The bosa lifts his hand to stroke his horse. Let us all three break our bonds, go on to nirvana. The weeping horse falls dead and is born in heaven. Grieving the loss of both the bosat and the horse, do you send me home empty-handed? Kana asks. I must tell the king your father all that has happened. Lord, give me leave to go, for that is now my task. He gives him leave in all his ornaments. Cross Samsara's ocean waters, do not falter. Tell the king my father to care for my young son. Tell my queen Yashodara to be comforted. When the minister Kana returned to the city that day, the queen turned on him. A lion is leaping to the kill. Kana friend, where is my lord, my beloved? Go bring him to me now, I must see him, I will. Her combed hair falls like loosened strands of gold. Her full breasts like two domes made of pure gold. Her lord gone to become a Buddha, to seek nirvana. Yashodara falls on her bed and breaks into sobs. You left resolved, your mind set on becoming a Buddha. I too made a firm resolve to always be your wife. We made our joint resolves and you gave me your hand. Why then did you leave today without a word? We were first born in the animal world as deer. Since that life, we two have never been apart. In every samsaric birth, I was always your consort. Why then in this life did you go, leaving me alone? Once we went as ascetics together to the forest, we happily carried our two children in our arms. We lived in two dwellings, separate but in the same forest. Why have you left me alone now? What have I done? With full awareness, I too made every effort. By the power of our resolves, we were always together. With our joined hands, we made all our gifts together. Why then did you leave me, my lord, without one word? My eyes are full, my garments wet, tears fall. As my husband, nectar-like, I recall. Abandoning our son, I know he has now left. Is there another woman in this world so bereft? Once in a former birth, we were born as squirrels and our young one into the ocean waters fell. I know how hard you strove to save him then, my husband, Lord. Why did you leave him now? Did I do wrong to bear you a handsome son? Did I fall short in beauty, goodness, strength? Was a disrespectful act unwittingly done? Or did you dream of being a Buddha, conquering death? You must know, my Lord, how the Kerala hatches its eggs, straining with its feet turned up to the sky. Flames of my grief rise up, they burn and scorch. I beat my breast in grief and openly cry. In the shadows of the forest you now walk. There is no resting place for you in that dark. Unceasing burns the fire that sears my heart. O oh, golden one, I beat my breast and weep. My moonlike lord who partook of fragrant food that I with special favors made for you. May sweet fruits grow in the forest for you, and fragrant flowers bloom for my lord of gold. Our flower-decked bed where we lay as our hearts desired. I cannot look on it now. It burns my breast. Striving to be a Buddha, unhindered you went. A searing sun now is the bed on which you slept. As Vesantara, do you recall how you went to the forest? Did I not look after you then, calm the forest for fruit? A care never crossed your mind then, was that not the truth? My moon-like lord, did I not constantly protect? Like the marks on the moon, was I not with you always? Who told you then to abandon me today? When I was asked to stay in Sanda Maha City, did I not weeping follow you that day?
I did not protest when you gave away our children. Was I not then a Vesantara that day? Did I not bear you the lovely Prince Rahula? Why then did you leave me and walk away? I never kept a secret from you ever. I never let you be troubled, not me, Yashodara. I, once so blessed, now weep inconsolably. Woman of a thousand virtues, I'm your Yashodara. Your cause was Buddhahood, I sense the signs. Yet I came with you as your wife every time. Now let meditation never leave my mind. Ah, the palace is dark today, O oh husband mine. You tied their hands and gave away our children. My golden breast oozed milk for them, my young. I fell at your feet and wept hot, scorching tears. To one who tried so hard, why do you cause such pain? Once both of us were born as kinduras. We lived together on the dark moon rock. Now, beloved, in one night we are torn apart. My heart is split. I can do nothing but sob. Countless times we gave away our children. Countless tears I've wept because of you. Tell me, have I ever wronged you, even unwittingly? Why did you leave to become a monk so secretly? In countless animal lives we perfected the virtues. I've always been true to you, my love. Why then do you do this to me now? Am I not your bimba, your nectar like Yashodara? She tore off her precious pearl and gemstone jewels, took off her gold and silks and the rings on her toes, pulled off the golden ornaments in her ears. The queen sat lifeless as if turned to stone. I shall wait weeping and wailing, lamenting my woes. Boundless tears will flow as I sob unceasingly. Confused and troubled, I now weep endlessly. Why did you do this to me, to part as never before? When you were born as an elephant in the forest, did not a vada hurl his arrow and make you fall? Did I not sit there beside you weeping and pleading? Oh, my husband, why have you now abandoned our son? When you were Mahasara, what didn't I do for you? I rubbed a rice and curry paste on my head and limbs. All those ordeals, however hard, were sweet to me. I was your Amaravati then, now your Yashodara. I went with you on your countless ascetic journeys, joined in many forms of worship and offering. I can't remember a wrong done even unthinkingly. Why did you leave me so alone and solitary? My lord, on a bed of forest flowers, are you sleeping? Your tender, lovely feet, are they now hurting? Are there sufficient gods around you guarding? Dear husband, my elephant king, where are you roaming? Whatever fault I may have had, my lord, I cooked and fed you flavored food and drink. You who now wander far away in the forest, may the blessings of the gods be with my lord. May all the forest fruits turn sweet for you. May men surround you as do bees of flower. May the sun dim his scorching rays for you. May God create shelters for you as you walk. My Lord no longer hears my sad laments. I don't see my gold-hued Lord even in my dreams. No, I too vow to renounce all worldly pleasures. Though he has left me, I'll abide by the moral rules. My heavy grief I'll bear, however hard. Like the air around me, I'll think only of my Lord. To become an Arahat unswervingly I'll try. Till I set eyes on him again, I'll tell my rosary. For seven days the Bosat stayed in a mango grove. On the seventh day, to Rahadaha he went. With his all-seeing eye, saw what former Buddhas have done. Then begged for alms, sat by the river and ate. Leaving Rahadaha, he said to King Bimbisara, I'll preach a sermon to you when I return. The Bosat then went to the Uruvela region, remained there as an ascetic for six years. Having vanquished Mara, the fearful god of death, he partook of milk rice offered by Sujata. The noble one's face now waxed like a full moon. He floated his golden bowl upstream on the river. Repeating a wish made far back in the beginning, Satya the Brahmin brought Kusa grass's offering. The Bosat happily accepted, walked to the Bodhi tree, saw the 21-foot Vajrasana there. 
The Bosset sat, contemplating virtues perfected. For his protection, the gods all gathered round. Mara's host came to, for they filled the area around. But he's now a supreme Buddha, all bonds destroyed. To enable his doctrine to last 5,000 years, the Buddha, full of merit, looked over the earth. To destroy all bonds, to save creatures from samsara, the noble one preached the sermon of the turning wheel. The noble Buddha looked with his all-seeing eye and made three visits in consecutive order. Aware his life would last another 45 years, he went to his father's city to preach to him. The gracious city was decked like a heavenly abode. 500 Arahat monks accompanied him. He gathered his kin, preached the doctrine to them. The city became enveloped in his halo of gold. Like a tree of pure silver, the weeping queen now comes. The light of the Buddha's halo en envelops her heart. Like a lovely vine escorted by her maiden, she comes, falls at the Buddha's feet, and breaks into sobs. Prince Rahula asks his father for his inheritance circling him like a golden star around a moon. The Buddha preaches a doctrine, the prince is fully convinced. Prince Rahula is ordained and becomes a monk. The Buddha preaches to the king, his father, eases his grief, sets him on the path to nirvana. Yashodara gives up past comforts, becomes a nun, with purity and wisdom keeps her vows. She lived in this way, thereafter thought, I'll perform a miracle, rid men and gods of doubt. The Blessed Queen pursued the life of a nun, sat long hours in meditative trance. All who do good can earn the same rewards, discard defilements, quickly gain relief. The Queen now sits cross-legged up in the air, says, I'll get permission, follow the discipline, and hereafter I'll be known as Rahula Mata. Soon the Queen sheds all impurities, then dies and wins Nirvana's highest bliss. Five hundred maidens achieve bliss with her. Her relics were enshrined in a beautiful stupa. All paid their respects with a rain of flowers. Siddhartha, now a Buddha, rained merit on her. With his Buddha hand placed flowers on her bier. She cast aside all worldly blessings and joined the order of the nuns. She broke all earthly bonds of grief as an Adarhat, brought glory to the nuns. She made offerings to men and gods when in the order of the nuns, she obtained permission, attained nirvana, the blessing that is beyond all blessings. When the prophecy was made that in this eon he would become a Buddha, you came with him like his shadow never left him anywhere. From the time he became a Buddha, you lived apart, reached nirvana first. The many occult powers you gained, you exhibited everywhere. Leaping over the seven oceans, not permitting them to overflow, you appeared in the ocean depths, swimming like a fish below. For the benefit of men and gods, many miracles you did show, Yashodara of great fame, to Nirvana you did go. Exhibiting various occult powers as offerings to the great Muni, now rising up to the sky in full sight of the great Muni, destroying grief, great Yashodara reached the ultimate Nirvana. Can we not now recount your virtues together in one voice? She sits in the three planes of the sky in their successive order, takes on the guise of Lord Sakra, Great Brahma, the Nagas, and the Garuda. She tells the crowds that gather around, I am Yashodara. She sings the praises of Lord Buddha, on that day dies, attains Nirvana. May all women bow your heads before the feet of Yashodara. Like a jeweled crown, she adorns the head of women everywhere. Listen, women, to this sermon, decide to be born like her. Plan to do every act of merit when this sermon you do here. You creatures who wish to gain nirvana, see life's pain, shed your love of samsara. Grasp not wealth that can only bring sorrow, do acts of merit, do not in suffering wallow. Women take the sermon well to heart, angry looks on your husbands do not cast. Like gold and mercury, live loving and united. Be born like Yashodara and be greatly blessed. Think always of your husband's well-being, don't demand he bring you this or that. Don't say a single word that might cause hurt. Love him and live happily together. When things get rough and there is not much to spend, be kinder to him than when things were good. It is not wrong a woman to care for a husband. Can't you too, like Ashodara, reach nirvana? Like Ashodara, be always true to your husband. 
Come ill or well, be unchanging, faithful ever. O women, if you love and are true to one husband, you will surely enjoy future heavenly praise. You will surely enjoy future heavenly praise. Be obedient to your husbands, all you women. Do not be sad and care for them when sick. Be like Ashadatta, who never thought of another. Accumulate merit so you can reach nirvana. All you women fill your hearts with goodness. Focus your mind constantly on good deeds. Love all creatures, protect them from life's pain. Then the nectar of nirvana you will surely gain. That is just really beautiful to me. Um, the author or the translator kind of talks about how there's sort of like three different voices in the poem and I can totally agree. And there's kind of that first one talking about um, setting up the stage with the Buddha and then, you know, this kind of middle female voice that talks so much about the queen's pregnancy cravings and, um, of course, Yashodara's lament, which is so painful. But it goes on so much about the queen's pregnancy cravings and Yashodara's laments that it definitely sounds like a female voice and then those kind of last couple stanzas are... Um, those last couple stanzas are definitely like a male author's addition to kind of keep women in line. It's kind of definitely, definitely a different voice, you know. I think this is a really important piece that is, I'm really glad this is now out and able to be analyzed by, um, by any, by I guess like Western Buddhist eyes, even though people make fun of Western Buddhists on meme pages <laughs> on Facebook. But, um, I think this is really important because, I mean, if we look at Jesus, I mean, there are so many comparisons that are always drawn between Jesus Christ and, you know, Shakyamuni Buddha, right? Or the Siddhartha Gautama Buddha, right? Always these comparisons drawn, so, I mean, what Mary Magdalene was to Jesus Christ, at least to what many people think, I'm kind of in the camp that thinks that Mary Magdalene was Jesus' lover. Um, I know there's that entire theory that they had kids in like the south of France or that the line is now in the south of France or something, blah blah blah, Cathars maybe, I don't know, Albigensian Crusade, something like that, I don't know, I'm, I'm just like throwing words out at this point, um, but I don't know about that, but I do think that Mary Magdalene and Jesus had this very intimate, special relationship, and I think that obviously this is kind of, you know, Buddhism's answer to that, or the Buddha's kind of version of that, as is his consort, and obviously this is his consort throughout all lives, you know. It kind of makes sense in the Buddhist kind of realm of thought that they did go through these lives as, you know, in the animal kingdom, and then they became humans, you know, so I think that that is really significant. Honestly, I think it's really a shame that, um, more Buddhists, or that Buddhists don't really question you know, this gigantic choice in Siddhartha's life where he literally left his wife and his kids. Nowadays, kind of unanimously throughout history, a man that leaves his wife and children is seen as the worst scum there possibly is. You know, that's a deadbeat dad. And that's literally what the Buddha did to his wife and his kid. Literally just left them. You know, um, there's a whole story about how Rahula goes to him and asks for his inheritance, you know, goes to his dad and asks the inheritance, goes to the Buddha and asks for his inheritance. And then, because the because his mother, Yashodara, Queen Yashodara, or Princess Yashodara, is like, hey, there's your dad, ask him, for his in ask him for your inheritance. And they kind of, I've always seen paintings of this, like, shown as this beautifully formal thing, like a traditional thing, but honestly, that's kind of what an angry baby mama would say if she saw her like ain't shit baby dad like on the street. But that's literally what a single mom would say if she saw her like ain't shit like broke ass like child support dodging like baby daddy like on the street and she was with their fucking kid. And she was like, hey, there's your dad, go ask him for money. You know, like that's like what, that's what a mom would say to a father that they felt was not, you know. <laughs> giving their kid what he needed and he definitely did not do anything for this kid for at least like the first part of the kid's life you know and obviously like leaving her literally ghosting her i think he ghosted her for like 80 years you know which is just really 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 sad could you imagine could you imagine the pain this woman felt of could you imagine the pain of your husband leaving you know everyone worshiping him or whatever and this being the source of your deepest pain and like seeing that, you know, and it's like, 
Okay, so they're all worshipping this, but they're not seeing that this person caused so much pain to the person that they were supposed to be there for. You know, so I think that this is really great that this is now translated so these feelings can be kind of parsed through for feminists, for Buddhist scholars, for people everywhere, anyone who wants to read this poem. Hopefully people are like seeing this poem through me making this video about it. I don't know. Um, I'm not going to go on too, too much. Um, I just think it's really, really beautiful. And I think that Yashadara did kind of speak through these words, honestly. Um, I made a post about it. I made a little micro essay, but um, I can read. I'm going to read the little post that I made about because I do like little book posts on my Instagram. So I'm just going to read out. I'm just going to read this out. Finally posting this beautiful book. Every single time I read it, I cry. My old friend Polly Murgerfree got this for me off my Amazon research wish, wish list. Thank you so much, Nick. By the way, um, my friend Nick got this for me off my Amazon research wish list where I put books that I can't afford to really get on my own or can't justify buying on my own. So hopefully seeing if people will want to buy them for me. Um, not kind of being a mooch, but kind of being a mooch. Sorry about that, people. But um, I don't know. I like books and I can't afford to get all the books that I want, so I'm just seeing which ones the universe wants to throw at me, and I guess the universe really wanted me to do this one. So thank you so much, Nick. Um, starting to look haggard on webcam here. But okay. The Sinhala Yashodara Vata, or the story of Yashodara, is a commonly known folk poem in Sri Lanka. The most well known stanzas are those where Yashodara is lamenting her husband's departure. I may be smiling in the selfie, but I was crying the entire time reading this. The meme on the last slide is what I actually look like while reading this. Most people gloss over the story of Yashodara in Buddhism and I think this is such a shame. Could you imagine being in her position? Being there for your husband in countless samsaric rebirths and him going off to find glory without you? A man who leaves his child and his wife is unanimously seen as scum across cultures, but Siddhartha Gautama did it and was praised the world over for his sacrifice. Sacrifice when the greatest sacrifice was actually that of his wife for waiting for him. This poem was written much later, but reading these words, I can feel the pain of a husband leaving his family and a wife's deep devotion and utter heartbreak in the face of the ultimate betrayal. What I find most interesting is when Yashodara implores Siddhartha, why didn't you even tell me? This is his sidekick in enlightenment, the other half of his soul, and he couldn't even clue her in on his plans adding insult to the already egregious injury of walking out on her and Rahula. When people create spiritually charged art, I believe the entity the artist is interacting with jumps into the piece of art. And I think the soul of Yashodara is fully alive and well speaking through these words. Eternally pure-hearted and shedding endless tears for her beloved, the Buddha. It's as if the tears she cried over those 80 plus years created a bottomless well of sadness on the astral plane which the anonymous Sinhalese poets somehow found and dove into, emerging with these heartbreaking words. What a poignant addition to the growing study of women in Buddhism. I also included some modern depictions of Yashodara to accompany the text. Enjoy! I think this being released in English is really great because it kind of brings to the forefront this suffering by Yashodara, and I think that this is a shadowy kind of figure that I think deserves a lot more um, scholarly attention. And I'm going to go through and read some of these dissertations and all. Um, there's a lot more work that I want to look through um, that is referenced in the intro of this book, which I'm really excited about. I'm going to probably be putting that in the, in the link description. But um, I think this is a beautiful poem. I think that this brings forth this new figure that I think... Um, I think this is kind of a... Not a dumb title, but I think that it can literally just be Yashodara. The the bodhisattva because she totally has bodhisattva qualities she shows more bodhisattva qualities to me than the buddha because he didn't really show good qualities in leaving his wife and his child but she showed amazing qualities by continuing to be loyal to him and always being loyal through these samsaric rebirths that she's gone through with him yeah that's kind of all i have for this i'm I, i'm probably gonna make another video talking more about the scholarly background of this but i just wanted to read the poem out and kind of just give you guys a quick overthrow via video Alright, bye. Thank you.